I always debate if I should tell a joke before uh, starting one of these um, presentations. I'm always worried I'm going to offend somebody. But it turns out that two people in the audience I know, so I'm going to go ahead with a joke. <laughs> so this pastor is giving a fire and brimstone talk. And it's about hell. And it's the devil this and the devil that. Well, wouldn't you know it, the devil appeared. Everyone stampeded for the exits. In fact, the pastor was the first one out. But this elderly woman in the front row doesn't move. She just sits there. The devil turns and looks at her and says, don't you know who I am? She says, I know who you are. Well, why aren't you afraid of me? She says, hell, I've been married to your brother for 30 years. <laughs> Okay, now we also have a giveaway, so I always have a medical trivia question. And if you win, you get one of our handy dandy packs over there. So, this isn't the question, this is the preamble to the question for the prize. So who can tell me why human blood is red? Oxidized. What? Iron. What happens to the iron? It's oxidized. Oxidized iron makes the blood turn red. I think you're going to get the answer to the riddle real quick. Why is the blood of lobsters green? No what? No iron. That's not the answer. But it's true there's no iron, but that's not the answer. They don't get oxygen. They get oxygen. They get oxygen. Why is their blood green? <laughs> she said they're cold. <laughs> it's not because they drink a green smoothie. Let me help you out. You said human blood is red because iron is oxidized. So what other metal, if it's oxidized, turns green? Who said copper? He gets the, the winner. Okay. Go ahead. Don't walk in front of this. What? Don't walk in front of this. Okay, so we're going to talk about health pitfalls of the busy executive. I think you all fall into that category. Well, it's a real jigsaw puzzle, isn't it, human health? And it gets uh, more aggravated when you're an executive. You know, if you're working uh, 9 to 5, you come home, you're done, you're not thinking about work, you can go play with your kids. But when you're an executive, you're always thinking of work, you're always busy. So as you can see here, it's a combination of stress, family history with genetics is very important. Environment, if you're sniffing uh, diesel fumes all day long, it's not good for you. So it's a real conundrum and a real puzzle, your health and how long you can live healthy. Now you know, uh, 100 years ago, the life expectancy of the average American was about 49. It's now 78 to 80. But that's life expectancy. They've now broken it down that the first 68 years you're going to leave, uh, lead a healthy life, and the last 10 years is just deterioration, circling the drain, so to speak. So, you know, the first step is you want to live as long as possible, as healthy as possible, without deteriorating. Now, we live in the age of omics. This is now going to be cutting edge medicine. For those of you that watch Star Trek, you're going to remember this, that, you know, medicine was all on the genetic, molecular level. We're really there now. We're really at the beginning of all this. We have all these omics, epigenomic, exposomics, nutrigenomics, microbiomics, toxicogenomics. It's a mouthful to say all those things. We're going to go through all of these, but they all matter. So we're all born with a genetic code. But how are those genes expressed? You know, we might have a genetic code that we're not going to get lung cancer if we're exposed to cigarette smoke. But we might have a gene that if we're exposed to paint fumes, we're going to get lung cancer. So how those genes are expressed is all important. And uh, in, I would guess in five years when you go for a physical, you'll have a genetic screen where your genetic code will be looked at and uh, you'll be told you can take these medicines safely, these you can't, here's the risks of your different diseases you might have, these you're okay. So you're going to have all these sort of different things. Now, stress. You know, in Japan, stress is an official cause of death. 
because uh, you have these Japanese executives working six, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. They are often found dead at their desk, and it's an official cause of death, stress. But how does stress affect your health? Well, I can tell you at least two simple ways. One, when you're constantly stressed, the body is constantly secreting adrenaline and other chemicals like adrenaline. Those breakdown products of adrenaline have been known for 50 years to be toxic to the heart. They lead to heart disease, coronary artery disease, and heart attacks. <coughs> Recently, we've been able to measure telomeres. Telomeres are your bits of DNA at the end of your chromosomes that control cell replication. So, the longer your telomeres are, the longer you live. The shorter they are, you're going to die. They've now shown people under constant stress, their telomeres shorten. So now we know we have a direct correlation. Stress causes the telomeres to shorten. The telomeres control cell replication in the whole body of everything. So there's a direct correlation. So stress has to be acknowledged and dealt with. You can't just say, I'm going to work hard and ignore the stress. It's going to kill you. By the way, the telomeres in cancer cells never, ever shorten. Cancer cells are immortal. That's why we die from cancer unless we treat it. So if we can harness the immortality of the telomeres in the cancer cells, then people will live one, two, three hundred years. Now that sounds really science fiction, but serious scientists at Harvard are thinking that in the future we will be living 150, 200 years in a healthy way, not the way you're thinking of being feeble in a nursing home and all the rest of it. In fact, I don't know if you all realize that a baby born today, the life expectancy of a baby born today is 100. Okay? So science is changing very rapidly. Now my partner, Dr. Anderson, who you'll hear from this afternoon, he has a theory that we all need to hang on as long as possible so that we can take advantage of these new uh, um, uh, things. Okay, so stress, thoughts, nutrition. Now nutrition, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit here, but nutrition is very complicated, isn't it? I mean, we all think we know how to eat healthy, right? Avoid saturated fat. No, no, avoid fat completely. No, wait, you could eat monosaturated fat, you know, the Mediterranean diet. What's the right thing to do? I mean, one general rule of thumb is don't overeat in general. And we know what's really bad and we should avoid that. But outside of that, it's, it gets complicated and we're going to talk about this a little bit. Physical activity, well, guess what? People that exercise on a regular basis over the age of 40, their telomeres don't shorten. Okay? Their telomeres don't shorten. That's why if you exercise regularly, you live longer. So it's pretty straightforward. Also, uh, getting back to nutrition, if you're lean over the age of 40, you live longer. In fact, in the British royal family, when they hit 40, their diet is completely controlled so that they stay lean. That's why the uh, kings and queens of England live so long, you know, outside if they get cancer from cigarette smoking and so on. <laughs> Environmental toxins. Gosh, you know, we were visiting our daughters at college this last weekend. We're walking down this college street, and there's a guy out on a driveway with a whole bunch of cupboards, and he's spray painting them with this metallic spray paint. No mask on him. I'm going like this walking past him. I mean, this is just a surefire way to get lung cancer because these are highly toxic things. And yet all of us will maybe spray or paint something or stain a deck and we don't protect ourselves. But even a short period of exposure can be damaging. So you have to think about all these things. And these toxins affect our genetic code. And then exposure to microbes, which we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Epigenomics, it's the expression of a gene that's passed down through generations. You know, blame it on grandpa. So, if your grandpa worked in an iron foundry and was exposed to all sorts of fumes before there were environmental protections, his sperm can have been damaged and then his child will have mutations in his or her genetic code and that'll be passed down to you. So it does matter, you know, you could be born with very good genes, but you could damage them and then pass them down to your family forever. Knowing your family history is extremely important to help your physician. And if your physician doesn't ask about your family history, give it to him or her. You know, write it out, have it as detailed as possible. It's very, very important. 
exposomics. That's the environmental impact on health and disease. So this is sort of what I've been talking about. Being stressed will affect your genetic code. Being exposed to toxins will affect your genetic code. All these things are very important. Nutrigenomics. Well, now, you know, you have macronutrients. You know about protein, fat, carbohydrates. You know you should limit fat in general. You know you shouldn't eat too many carbohydrates, your donuts and cakes and cookies and all that. You know you should have good quality protein, generally like white chicken meat, white turkey meat, egg whites. You know, I think you're going to hear a lot about that today. But recently, with new developments in nutrition, we now look at micronutrients. So micronutrients are your nutrients inside your cell. So, you know, you've been to the doctor before, they take blood from you, they say your blood tests are fine. The doctor is assuming that if it's normal in your blood, it's going to be normal inside your cell. It's going to penetrate the cell membrane and go into your cell, and it's going to be fine. Well, now we can actually measure what's going on inside your cell, and we find that it isn't the case. You know, we've had many patients take a small example, have great vitamin D levels in their blood, but inside their cell, their vitamin D is very low. And you can prove this scientifically. Well, what's the big deal? Well, low vitamin D increases your risk of breast cancer in women and colon cancer in both genders and prostate cancer in men. So it is a big deal. And having inadequate vitamin D predisposes you to more infections. This is just a small example. And yet vitamin D is a few pennies a day to fix the problem. You just have to know you have a problem. Okay? So micronutrients are very important. Of course, fiber in your diet helps prevent a host of problems, including colon cancer. And then phytonutrients, of course, are antioxidants from plant-based materials, things like blueberries, raw spinach, uh, green tea. All these things are loaded with antioxidants called phytooxidants, and they're very, very important. Now, uh, in the regard to uh, nutrition as well, an even newer development is the concept of food sensitivities, which is very complex and very new, and doctors are still sorting through it. Um, there's a test that we do called the ALCAT test that looks at different food sensitivities. Now, you might think of it as food allergies. It's divided out. Food allergies are the ones where, you know, you eat shrimp and your throat swells up. But food sensitivities are where you eat something and there's inflammation at the cellular level and you don't feel good. You can't put your finger on what's wrong, but you just don't feel right. So for example, using myself, I had this test recently, and lo and behold, something extremely healthy that I try to eat all the time, egg whites, I'm terribly sensitive to. So I had to eliminate egg whites, and I thought, this is just crazy. Egg whites are full of protein, there's no fat, they're great to eat, but I eliminated eggs and I feel better. You know, so this is a new uh, area of medicine. It's brand new over the last year. And uh, so you're going to see more of this in the future, too. So uh, what seems to be so straightforward and simple in medicine is constantly getting more complicated. Eventually, we'll get to the truth of all this, because once you get to the DNA, the genetic code, the software of your hardware, which is your body, then we can actually customize and tell everyone what you really need to do. Microbionics. Yeah, the human body has 100 trillion microorganisms. There's more DNA of bugs in you, bacteria, than your own DNA, okay? And, you know, we've always known that we live in harmony with these bugs. But if you destroy the harmony, bad things can happen. So uh, most people know that certain antibiotics can give you uncontrolled diarrhea, you know, so-called pseudomembranous enterocolitis. So, you know, that's a simple example where you destroy the normal uh, f uh, flora and uh, you need to restore it with other antibiotics. Yogurt's good as a probiotic to keep your, uh, uh, you know, intestinal flora healthy. But there's more. Last week, you may have read in the paper that they found this astounding study out of Harvard that it isn't saturated fat per se that causes coronary artery disease. Now, saturated fat isn't good for you anyway, okay? But it was always the assumption, saturated fat and red meat clogs the arteries. They found it isn't the fat, it's a chemical in red meat called carnitine. So you eat this carnitine, it goes into your guts, and guess what? The bacteria in your guts digest carnitine 
and secrete a poison into your blood that causes your heart to clog up. Now this is a mind-boggling revelation. Just think about it. Bacteria in your gut are killing you. It sounds like something out of that movie Alien, you know? But it's true. And so a lot of things in medicine, they say things are evidence-based. Well, they had evidence-based. If you add, ate, ate foods with saturated fat, you got sick. It's true. But it wasn't from the saturated fat. So the story's constantly evolving. And uh, a third thing that they found is that there's a bacteria in the large intestine, if you have too much of it, um, uh, it's a bacteroides type of bacteria, uh, that is associated with the development of colon cancer. You know, it starts the polyps that y'all should have colonoscopies for at age 50 and over. Uh, and, uh, and then those polyps turn into cancer. So the, the bacteria in our guts, and you know, it's always been under the nose of doctors. Oh, we got all these bacteria, we live in harmony with them. You know, end of story. It's not the end of the story. You know, it's a constant daily interaction. So something that's uh, gonna be happening. And then toxigenomic, I don't know what's causing it, toxigenomics. Okay, toxigenomics <laughs> is again these uh, different toxins that we're exposed to, the environmental factors and so on. So, uh, and of course smoke, uh, and I mean both tobacco smoke and marijuana smoke and any other smoke uh, is toxic to you and you should avoid it, period. I do have a patient with emphysema, he's 72, he's got dreadful lungs, he's never smoked a tobacco cigarette in his day, but he smoked weed every day. <laughs> and he said, I thought weed was safe. <laughs> no. So of course, control what you can. You want good nutrition, exercise, which you're going to be doing all day long. I'm thrilled with it. Reduce stress. We all give lip service to reducing stress, but we actually have to do it. How many times do we say, well, I'm going to have a short vacation this year because I'm just too busy? Or maybe I'll take a long weekend. I'm gonna, not going to take a couple of weeks off. Big mistake. You're going to be more productive when you're refreshed and relaxed and you can work better. So uh, getting adequate rest is very important. Now we talk about uh, supplements. As you know, there's always been a big controversy about supplements. The uh, angle goes that if you eat right, you really don't need supplements. Well, first of all, very few people eat right. Uh, number two, uh, there's a lot of um, um, unusual things depending upon where you live. So for example, here in North Texas, the only time sunlight makes vitamin D in our bodies is late spring and summer. The rest of the year, the UV rays will not make vitamin D. So unless you eat foods rich in vitamin D, which are things like salmon, tuna, and codfish, you're not going to get adequate vitamin D. Remember, low vitamin D increases your risk of certain cancers. So a lot of people need vitamin D supplements and so on. And we see a lot of people come in with a shoebox full of supplements and they're the wrong supplements, you know. So it's important to know which supplements you need and you can do the micronutrient analysis to know that. Um, but the, they also did a study on the uh, supplements sold in uh, grocery stores and drug stores uh, and found a lot of them are just useless. They're almost just sugar pills because the industry's not regulated. You know, uh, 95, I think Clinton deregulated it. So you got to be careful what you get. And a uh, small plug at Executive Medicine, we have our own supplement line, but it is pharmaceutical grade. It's insured to be what it says it'll be. Um, now, hormone optimization. This is a huge, huge development in medicine, both for men and women. Um, you know, the, the angle 10 years ago was, well, as men age, their hormones drop, and that's just the way it should be. The men should just accept their aging, okay? Well, we now know that's not the case. We know that, for example, if a man needs testosterone, it doesn't cause prostate cancer. It does cause vitality, it, it keeps muscle mass up, it keeps the brain uh, better, you don't have brain fog, you can think better, your cognitive functions are better. So uh, if a man needs testosterone, it's really a good thing to do. But men make small amounts of estrogen. So we are finding a lot of men with good testosterone, too much estrogen. 
you know, they're watching chick flicks, they're crying spontaneously, <laughs> you know. And there's an estrogen blockers. There's a pill a man can take once a week to block his excess estrogen. And I've had a lot of men that, you know, we put them on estrogen blockers and their sex life returned to normal and, and they became more vibrant. So uh, it's very important. In women, of course, um, if it's safe for a woman to take estrogen after menopause, she should, or progesterone. But the big thing for women is testosterone. A lot of women do not have any testosterone. Now, what happens when a woman doesn't have testosterone? Well, she has brain fog, she can't think clearly, and there's no sex drive whatsoever. Now, uh, recently uh, I put some uh, testosterone pellets in a few women in our practice, and their husbands called me a week later to thank me profusely. <laughs> One of them gave me courtside tickets to a Mavericks game. <laughs> And he said, never stop giving it to her. <laughs> so um, hormones are uh, very important in both genders. And I think it's one of the major breakthroughs in understanding. In other countries, England and Canada, they still have, well, men should just accept aging. No, you don't have to accept aging. You can stay vibrant. So very, very important. Now, reduction of inflammation. This sounds like really generic. What's the big deal, inflammation? Well, what if I told you if you have inflamed gums from some gum disease and you don't go to the dentist, you've just increased your risk of heart attack three times? You say, what? That's right, because you get general body inflammation. All the arteries in your body get inflamed and that can lead to heart attacks. And we have a picture in a few moments that I'll demonstrate this to you. And of course, uh, we mentioned smoking, alcohol, proper hydration. So if you weigh 200 pounds, your base intake of water should be 100 ounces a day. If it's in the heat of the summer, add 30%, it'd be 130 ounces. What if you drank four cups of coffee a day? Add another 32 ounces, because coffee and tea dehydrates you. If you drink alcohol, it dehydrates you. So people are constantly walking around mildly dehydrated. And it's, if you drink adequate water, you're going to feel better, you're going to function better, you're going to think better. Now, this was a, a picture here of, um, let's see if this works, yeah. Now, so this is a, a picture of a coronary artery. So you see here, here's the heart. The coronary arteries are on the surface of the heart, and we're taking uh, an enlargement of it here. So here we have a person with a relatively modest blockage. Uh, in their coronary arteries, we call it plaque, and it's got a fibrous cap. This little white area is fibrous, you know, sort of like scar-like tissue. And this person goes for a physical. They might even have an exercise treadmill test without imaging, and they pass it with flying colors. And the doctor says, well, you're in great shape, no problem. Lo and behold, this plaque has a lot of inflammation with it. It can be worse with inflammation from other parts of the body, like your mouth, for example or it could be inflamed for a variety of reasons. One day, suddenly, the plaque ruptures. It just breaks open. Well, what does a body do whenever you have something happen to you, right? It bruises. You get blood, so the body forms blood here to block this ruptured plaque. Well, now, this blood clot is just 100% blocked your artery. You went from 30 or 40% blockage to 100%, and you've just had a major heart attack with permanent heart damage and maybe death, okay? So besides the inf inflammation that we're demonstrating here, we're demonstrating the flaws in some of the routine physicals. You know, you can have a routine physical and it gives you a certain sense of reassurance, but it's not 100%. 40% of people who have heart attacks, for example, have normal cholesterol levels. Normal cholesterol, they had a heart attack. What's going on? Well, there's a lot of things going on, but one of them is you don't have, you, that patient didn't have an advanced lipid panel. He just had the regular cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL, HDL is your good cholesterol, LDL is your bad cholesterol. And um, I'm going to stand on this side here. And uh, what wasn't looked at is particle size. So when you have an advanced lipid panel, you look at the particle size of your LDL and HDL. So for example, 
You could have perfect cholesterol, but your LDL, your so-called bad cholesterol, is all pattern B, meaning it's small and dense, instead of large and fluffy. Okay, when it's large and fluffy, you're less likely to get blockage. And this also explains why we see some, especially uh, people from India, they'll have cholesterols at 350, normal's less than 200, and they don't have any heart disease. It's because their LDL cholesterol is all pattern A, it's all large and fluffy. So you have to look at the right things. If you don't look at the right things, you don't know what you're doing. It's sort of like repairing an airplane. If you look at the wing and you don't look at the elevator, you know, you haven't looked at the whole thing. So here's an actual patient of ours, 41-year-old male. He looked outstandingly healthy, 5'11", 216, very muscular, works out, only 18% body fat. I mean, not an Olympian, but pretty darn good. Probably better than 90% of the people in this room, including myself. Uh, he had a history of high cholesterol. He's on medication. He'd been having some weird chest pains, irregular heartbeats. He went to a cardiologist, had a regular stress test, passed it. Cardiologist told him, you're fine, no problem. You know, go ahead. You're, he's going on a mountain hiking expedition in two days. Coincidentally, he came in to see us for a physical. Well, part of our physical, we do a calcium score of the coronary arteries, which many cardiologists are recommending, I think almost all. Found out that his score was sky high. His probability of serious coronary artery disease was very high. Based on that, he had a CTA, that's a CAT scan arteriogram, and it revealed he had 98% blockage. So he canceled his trip and he had angioplasty and stenting and had a full recovery. And to add to the story, a year later, someone offered to buy out his business for $20 million and he sold it. Because he thought, what am I working for? I got enough money to live on. So now, metabolic syndrome. You may or may not have heard this term. Metabolic syndrome is a constellation of problems. High cholesterol, high sugars to uh, uh, getting in the cells and lowering your sugar. So, of course, diabetes is a dreadful problem. It can cause you to be kidney failure, cause uh, uh, blindness, uh, lose your feet, your legs get cut off from gangrene, from poor circulation, impotence, and all the rest of it, and leading to death. Usually when I talk to my men, I'll say, you know, you could go blind, okay. You could go to kidney failure and need dialysis, okay. You might lose your legs, well, that's terrible. You could become impotent, what? I gotta stop this now. <laughs> So, you know, diabetes is a major problem in the United States. Now, you don't have to be skinny to beat diabetes. Just don't be obese. It's okay to be 10 to 20 pounds overweight. In fact, recent studies show you have a better survival. People that are perfectly fit who get sick, they have no reserves on their body to fight the illness. You know, say of cancer or pneumonia or something like that. They've actually shown that if you're 10 pounds overweight, you have better survival. You live a bit longer. But you just can't be way out there. You know, can't be obese. So you need to get down. And it's hard, it's not easy, but it can be done. So we had a 58 year old male, an executive. Uh, he was six foot one, 296 pounds. He had a lot of body fat. Um, he uh, had gone to a, a, a one of these weight loss places with the liquid protein shakes and all this. And, uh, you know, they had put him on stuff. It worked for a while. Then he gained the weight back. He still had fatigue, insomnia, no sex drive, anxiety. He was depressed as hell. Well, he also had diabetes. And the weight loss clinic simply hadn't done a proper evaluation on him, hadn't done a, a, a complete evaluation. On top of that, he was taking so many B vitamins, he was toxic from them. You can be poisoned from too much vitamins, too. So we got him all uh, straightened around. Oh, and low testosterone. You know, uh, this will be a big motivator for men with too much body fat. When you have too much body fat, all your testosterone and your testicles make is just stored in the body fat. And then there's none in your blood to work on. So slimming down will improve your testosterone also. So we got everything turned around. He lost 50 pounds in a healthy way. His diabetes is just diet controlled, and he did get on testosterone. He feels terrific. So executive pitfalls. These are obvious, but I'll just go through them. Putting work before health. I mean, health should be as important in your to-do list as anything else. Eating right, exercising, resting, playing. 
playing is very, very important. At uh, one of the uh, clinics we're at, uh, one day, uh, we had Judy come in uh, with Play-Doh. And we took all the staff down over the lunch hour, over tables, and had a Play-Doh molding contest to see who could make the best figures out of Play-Doh. The staff talked about that forever. I mean, all their worries were forgotten for an hour. Work was forgotten. Home stress was forgotten. And, you know, play is very, very important. But for executives, always under stress, always traveling. Traveling jet lag is just terrible. Uh, by the way, if you travel uh, east, if you go from west to east and it's a long trip, uh, one way to beat jet lag is to take Viagra. Now, I'm not kidding. It really works both for men and women. It's not going to give the effect in women. It gives the effect in men. But uh, I have a patient from Kuwait who travels here. And uh, I told him to take Viagra. And he was very skeptical, but he took it. He's my friend for life now. I mean, he doesn't have jet lag, and he get, arrives with a smile on his face, so, you know. <laughs> Eating out too much. Now, this is an interesting thing. We all know restaurant food is fatty and salty. Did you know the top steakhouses, why their steaks taste so much better than the steaks at home? They take a hypodermic needle and inject butter into their steaks. Butter. I mean, the steaks are fatty enough. They inject butter. That's why eating out is so dreadful for you, so dreadful. Too much caffeine. Ca caffeine speeds up your heart rate, raises your blood pressure, makes you jittery and nervous, and then it dehydrates you. I mean, it's just not good for you. Alcohol. You know, I tell all my patients, as you get older, cut the alcohol. Your body can't handle it. You know, it can't handle it. Um, I saw a patient yesterday um, her spouse brought her in. Uh, she had all these problems. I took one sniff at her. She smelled like a winery. <laughs> I said, how much do you drink? Oh, I only drink, you know, a half a bottle to a bottle every day of wine. <laughs> well, there's her problem, you know? I mean, that led to a whole host of problems. And it, what's fascinating is her spouse had just gotten used to it. The spouse who doesn't drink didn't think this was a big deal. You know, and it's amazing how many, uh, I have a lot of patients, I only drink six beers a day. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, do you know how many calories this is? Do you know what it does to your liver, your brain? It's just amazing. So, I mean, I, I know this is radical, but I think by the time you hit 50, you should give up alcohol, you know, except for maybe Christmas or Thanksgiving or something like that. I mean, it's just not good for you. It's pure and simple. I know it's radical. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy for your family. You know, you know that old Harry Chapin uh, song about uh, the son always asking to play with the dad and the dad saying, I'll be with you in a while, son, and he never is. And then the son grows up and the son doesn't have time for his dad. You know that song? I mean, it's true. I mean, after all, when you're on your deathbed, who says, I wish I would have worked more. I mean, does anyone say that? No. I wish I would have spent time with my family more, right? I wish I would have played catch with my son or grandson more. You know, you need to find time for it. You, and the surprising thing, you'll be more productive at work. You won't be less productive. You'll be more productive. So facts. Those who work more than 50 hours a week average only six hours of sleep. That's 45 hours short of sleep per month. Working 10 hours a day or more increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, heart and stroke by 60%. There's a link between long work days and decreased cognitive function, i.e. dementia. You know, you work, 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 and then you get older and you're totally demented. <laughs> and 11 hours of work a day is linked to depression. Well, who the hell wouldn't be depressed working 11 hours a day, right? <laughs> Solution, gosh, number one, have a weekly date night. If you have a spouse, if you have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, for heaven's sakes, spend time with them. Go out, do things you wouldn't normally do. Uh, last Saturday, we went bowling. I'm a horrible bowler, but you know what? I didn't think about any of my worries while I was bowling. I was worried about those gutter balls, you know? So um, do something that you're not used to. 
And make time for your hobbies. If you don't have a hobby, get one, you know? Um, now with the internet, I play chess on my iPhone all the time, all over the world, or, or words with friends, whatever, you know? Find some hobbies, something to take your mind off things. Screen breaks, you know, staring at your computer all day long. I have all sorts of people come in with neck pain, you know, because they're staring all the time, takes breaks. The wavelength of light off your computer makes your pineal gland in your head stop producing melatonin. What do you need melatonin for? Sleep, right? So two hours before you go to sleep, you should turn off all your you know, TVs, computers, etc. You'll sleep better, you'll sleep sounder. One thing is to keep a journal so you can empty your brain before bed. Now you could empty it by talking to your spouse, but your spouse might be asleep when you're halfway through. But keeping a journal, writing things down, it used to be said, keep a diary. It really helps, you know, dear diary, I feel like crap, you know, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> and laugh and smile. I, patients come in, they're so sad, they're so dour for crying out loud. I mean, you only live once, enjoy life, you know? You know, you can laugh at the Mavericks or the Cowboys, you don't have to yell at them, you know? <laughs> and never sit for more than 30 consecutive minutes. Get up and move. They actually have desks now that are treadmills. Can you imagine you're standing all day on the treadmill doing your work? So they have those. I think it's a great idea. I've never tried one, but I think it's a great idea. So you can do all these things. You just have to make it a priority. You know, you go back to work tomorrow, you'll be inundated with things. You know, tonight, make a to-do list and put these things as priorities and just make sure you get them done. So this is, look at all the things happening to the body. Diabetes, rashes, stress, alcoholism, accidents, out, oh my God, how do we ever live? You know, it's just amazing we survive. But you can get rid of a lot of these things uh, with the things that we've mentioned. And now what happens when something goes wrong? You go to the bathroom tomorrow and you have rectal bleeding. Oh, those are just hemorrhoids. I'll just, yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> You know, I had a patient in 1978 who came in with rectal bleeding. He said, it's hemorrhoids. I said, well, let me check it out. I examined him. He had bleeding hemorrhoids. I said, we need to scope you. I don't want anything up my butt. Forget, no, no. I said, you got to be scoped. I scoped him. He also had a bleeding cancer. He had bleeding hemorrhoids. He also had bleeding cancer. I got Christmas cards from him for 30 years before he passed away. He had surgery and his cancer was cured because you can't make stuff up. You can't just assume things. You have to check things out. And of course, get proper nutrition and exercise. And your next speaker, Larry North, is going to talk all about that. He's a terrific speaker. So, you know, take charge of your time. Schedule and then take your vacation. And when you go on vacation, don't think about work. Just relax. Sleep adequately, and in terms of sleep, if you're snoring, get a sleep study. You might have sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, every time you stop breathing at night, you knock off three or four million brain cells. Well, after a while, you're going to be demented. You know, so, uh, you know, you spend a third of your life in bed, and yet you never look at what happens while you're sleeping. So, you know, if you're snoring, if your wife says you're snoring, or, you're, or if your husband says you're snoring, get a sleep study. Set personal goals. Uh, in our family, once a year, we have a state of the family meeting, you know? And uh, my wife and I go out and we talk about our kids, our marriage, and everything else, and we set personal goals for the year. And then we have a meeting with all the kids. State of the family. You could have a state of the you meeting with yourself. You know, where are you at? What are your goals? What do you really want to do? I've always wanted to play in the World Series of Poker. I'm gonna go play this year. I might get killed in the first hour, but I'm going to go try it because I've always wanted to do it. I mentioned there, optimize your health and your hormones. I've spoken on the hormones. I think it's very important to look at the hormones in the right way and make sure your doctor is versed in the hormones. So very quickly, for men, the ratio between your total testosterone and your estradiol or estrogen level should be 20 to 1. Very important. And for women, uh, if you get a testosterone level, doctors will know the estrogen and progesterone, but the testosterone level, so for example, in one lab, I saw a woman recently, her testosterone level, the normal was between 4 and 35, and her level was 5. The doctor says, well, you're fine. 
Well, she had no sex drive. She had brain fog. That wasn't fine. You know, five is normal, so is 38. You know, so we gave her testosterone, everything went away. So you have to look at this properly. And then get a proper physical. Of course, we recommend the yearly executive physical. There's some controversy over this. The only thing I'll say about this is when uh, the U.S. Periodic Task Force on Health talks about physicals, and they say this test isn't necessary, this one isn't necessary, they are taking economic factors into account. They're basically saying if an insurance company like Medicare has a certain bucket of money, how can we get the most out of that money for the population? So they're looking at the herd, the group. But if you're looking at you from an individual point of view, it is worthwhile to get these tests because it's you and it's your money. If you want to spend it, you, we have the technology, we have the ability to make you healthy and helping you live as long as possible in as healthy a way as possible. It is possible. Okay, are there any questions? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For uh, testosterone, um, uh, for men or women, uh, you can get creams or gels, which you use daily, so your levels go up and down daily. Uh, or you can have shots that can last one to six weeks, and that goes up and down. Or you can use the pellets, which are buried under the skin in your butt here, and they last for six months. They go up and they stay constant for six months. So the pellets are definitely a better way to go. So that's... Those are not largely covered by insurance now. Is there any movement towards that? There is. There are it's some really that's a superior yeah, way of delivery. It is superior. Uh, there are some insurance companies that are now reimbursing it somewhat. Uh, now, at Executive Medicine, we do the pellets, but we don't take insurance. We say, you pay, file your own insurance. And the reason is, just so you know, uh, when we do file insurance, say a doctor's office files insurance, it costs them 13% to file and collect the money. So then you'd have to increase the rates. So it's, it's just sort of crazy. But I'll tell you what, the people who use the pellets, they never go back. They love it. Yeah? Um, what recommendations do you have for reducing inflammation? Ah, well, um, first of all, we mentioned the dental aspect. That's very important. And then get your blood checked. So for example, the cardio CRP test that I alluded to. If it's high, and it'll, it'll be stratified, it'll say you're at high risk of cardiovascular disease, okay? So first of all, in that case, we tell you to take a children's aspirin once a day to help prevent that blood clot. And number two, the statin drugs, things like Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor, all those, which are used for cholesterol, they have a separate function. They actually reduce your body's inflammation. So you don't, you, even if your cholesterol is good, you can take those drugs in small doses to reduce your body's inflammation. So there's things that can be done. And you know, like Zocor is $4 a month now. It's really cheap. So it's not expensive. It's just a matter of knowing if you have it. Yeah? You didn't say anything about napping. You talked about the seven and a half hours. <laughs> I mean, my parents, they believed in taking little naps throughout, little short power naps. So, and the seven and a half hours I've read, it doesn't have to be yeah, you know, uh, naps really don't do much. Um, the power naps sort of allude to the fact, well, you can just nap for 40 minutes or half an hour and you'll be refreshed. Uh, the fact is that to get into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, takes about an hour and a half. So you'd have to nap at least two hours to get anything out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I may be asking the fox about the state of the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Can you comment on the trend toward um, concierge medicine? Oh. Well, yeah, concierge, the question was comment on concierge medicine. So concierge medicine is where medical doctors in a practice take a limited number of patients. And uh, the patient pays money, uh, a yearly fee, to be one of his patients. So a doctor, instead of having 3,000 patients, might have 300 patients. And the reason is to spend more time with the patient. So the doctor will make the same amount of money, but will work as many hours. It will just be able to spend more time with each patient. I'm all for it. 
I mean, you know, patients aren't the only ones disgusted by quick medical visits. Doctors hate it too. You know, I hated it uh, in, in a regular uh, practice. But, you know, in a regular practice, you know, you have a fee, say you charge $100. The insurance company gives you 60, writes off the 40, then it costs you 13% of the 100 to collect it. So out of the 100, you're down to $47. Well, now you've got to have volume uh, you know, to, in order to pay the bills. In the meantime, that the insurance companies aren't raising your reimbursement, you still got to give raises to your staff. So that's the, the thing for concierge medicine. Yeah. Oh, the, the ultraviolet rays from the sun change because in the fall and the winter we're further away from the sun. So the actual uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, rays are not the right ones. I don't have that information with you, but th that's why. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned pharmaceutical grade vitamins. What, I mean, what are See, it's a, it's a really hit and miss thing uh, with pharmaceutical grade vitamins because they've done studies on a lot of different branded vitamins and it's really hit and miss. So say you're buying, uh, well, take vitamin D and it says it's 1,000 international units. Some brands it's 1,000, other brands it's 500. There's no way of knowing. Uh, so, you know, we developed our own line uh, through Douglas Labs to make sure that what's in there is in there you know, pure and simple. So uh, I, there's other brands I'm sure will be fine. It's just hit and miss. It's just very difficult, yeah. Yeah. So, so to that point, that was my question as well. What source is there to go and ascertain what's the correct uh, site, if you will, to get the right information? For what, vitamins? For vitamins. And there is no site. There is no site. Well, I mean, we have it, but I mean, I think the question was, is there a general site for all the vitamins? You know, is Centrum or this or that? Uh, there is no sort of website for that. Yeah, because it's unregulated. Yeah. I, I wish it was regulated, by the way. Yeah. Um, my husband recently had his physical and the doctor told him that he had too much um, omega-3, the fish oil, that that was causing problems with his enzyme count. Is that possible? Can you, get, can you take too much of the omega-3? Um. You know, I, I have to know the details of the case. The only thing I would guess that was it his pancreas that was inflamed? Liver. Liver? Hmm. Well, if he had a fatty liver, uh, it would be unlikely from omega-3s unless he was taking a bucket of them a day. It's more from too much fat in the diet or alcohol. So I'd have to know more about it. But, uh, but you know, if you take 3,000 uh, milligrams of omega-3s a day, you should be fine. Yeah. Uh, about how much with all the lab costs and everything do the executive physicals cost at your practice? Yeah, you know, executive physicals, there's different levels. So they can range from 1750 all the way up to five grand. It just depends on what you get. So it's, um, and, and then you file your own insurance. Some insurances have reimbursed all of it, some of it, none of it. Uh, every insurance company is different, you know. But you're going to get something back from insurance. I don't think you'll get zero. Yeah. Uh, now, a lot of companies pay for executive physicals. Yeah. Has there been new changes in taking aspirins, effective aspirins on cancers or others? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that small dose of aspirin helps prevent uh, polyps that lead to colon cancer. Uh, it's a big controversy of uh, taking it to help prevent coronary artery disease. But you know, when they say don't take it routinely to prevent coronary artery disease, that's where a person hasn't had a physical, hasn't had any tests, and is just taking it generally. And they're worried about bleeding from the stomach from aspirin. But you know, if there's evidence of uh, vascular disease, then it's very justified to take aspirin. Everyone agrees with that. It's just a matter of knowing it.